I'm not a historian. Uh, and my methodology and my work is probably open to a great deal of question. Um, and I thought rather than bore you with my well-crafted PowerPoint, I would actually go back to the primary materials. And I've, this has sort of been quite cathartic for me because it's made me try and realise what I'm actually doing. So I'm, I'm going to read to you from the Haley Burian of October the 20th, 1875. Uh, and this is a match report. So it, it's, the, it's a football section of the school magazine. And it refers to Halebury College v Ravenscourt Park. This, the school's first foreign match of the season, was played at Halebury on Saturday, October the 9th. The ball was kicked off at 2.45 by Ravenscourt and play was even for a short time. But the school soon worked the ball down near the Ravenscourt goal line and by a good run, Dutton got a touchdown. The try, therefore, from was unsuccessful. With the exception of one good run by Enthorn for Ravenscourt, when by a drop he landed the ball behind the school goal and forced them to touch down, the school penned their adversaries pretty closely until half time, but obtained no other advantage, though once Dutton by another good run got over the Ravenscourt line but was carried back. After half time, Ravenscourt now, having advantage of the slight hill, turned the tables on their opponents and penned them completely for a time and the school forwards seemed to collapse considerably. Endhoven made two good runs and got in twice for Ravenscourt, but no goal was scored. The school rallied, and Melville, by a capital run, carried the ball well up to Ravenscourt goal line. Some very smart all-round play now ensured on both sides, and the school worked hard, but were unable to secure any further advantage. And thus, when no side was called, the match ended in favour of Ravenscourt by two tries and a touchdown to one try. Among the Ravenscourt team were 11 old Haley Burians. For the strangers, Endhoven, Shaw and Blomfield did good service behind the scrimmages, whilst Giles and Pavis were especially noticeable forward. For the school, Melville three-quarter back and Dutton half back were very useful. Now, what's this sort of reminding me why I was doing this? Because then it, there's a list of the players. Uh, and Ravenscourt are not a school, they're a club. So immediately we've got this quite interesting thing that we've got a school team, and it's a school or is it a college, which is another interesting issue. And there's 22 on one side and 20 on the other. So you've got this sort of quite strange phenomenon going on. Uh, and then we've got a list of the following matches still to come. Marlborough Nomads, Jesus College Cambridge, Cambridge Rugby Union, the Old Boys, Richmond, and Ravers Court Park return. So in 1875, Halebury aren't playing a single other school at rugby, which is quite an interesting idea because I'd have assumed that they would have this fixture list against local public schools or relatively local public schools. But they don't play any public schools, but they play men's teams. And then we see this other phenomena that they play a lot of Cambridge sides and a lot of the teams they play consist of old Haley Burians. So Marlborough Nomads have a lot of Haley Burians in them. So this is boys playing against men, which seems quite odd. And then even odder, the old Haley Burians, which is the old boys, will then go and play against other schools. So instead of the schools playing against each other, they're playing against men all the time, both both ways around. So I was a bit intrigued by all of this, but this is this is where I started. So here is here, here is Haley Bridge. It's quite a magnificent place, um, and there's a lot of history. This is the archive uh, in this bit here, where I've spent qu quite a few hours. Uh, bizarrely, it has no electrical power. So you have this incredibly amazing place, and there is not a single socket in this, in this, in this room. Um, so I go in there and I, I, I meet the archivist, who's an art historian, and busy myself. Um, just a bit about the history of the college. Um, there's a lot of confusion about Halebury. It is a public school now, but previously, those buildings and that site was occupied by the East India College from 1806. Some sports historians have wrongly attributed 
East India College to Haileybury School. So, for example, it's credited with having rugby there in, or football there in 1830, but this, this has nothing to do with Haileybury School. So, the East India College, what it did was it trained administrators for the Honourable East India Company. And its function was to train a civil service, to go and work in India and then China. It ends up, uh, because of the, the time period and the end of patronage, that it's shut down by statute. So we have this quite odd phenomena. I mean, there's debates happening in Parliament about Haileybury College and its role in training. And the Haileybury College Act 1855 shuts down the college. So the college is to be discontinued and not to take any more students. Their students tended to be a bit older because they had perhaps had even been through education and were then being trained to go into uh, the civil service. And the complaint was that this was very, it was, it was, it was very elitist and it was uh, people coming out from universities couldn't access the civil service because you hadn't been through the East India College. So it's shut down and that's when Haley becomes the life as a school. Um, it starts in 1862 and the importance is of the first master who has come from rugby school and that's the link to football so we start to see that they, they appoint people from rugby school so they open in 1862 with only 57 pupils from nine upwards there's a couple of some nine-year-olds um, and this is this is the first bit of the first prospectus the education of the sons of the clergy and laity of the home and eastern counties uh, same principles of Marlborough and Russell. And these, are, these are because the, the, the Dean, I think, from Manchester who advised them had been involved in setting up Marlborough and Russell. So, so there was a link to these schools. So we've got a link to those schools and to rugby school. So I go there and I think, what, what, am, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What's the purpose and point of this? I'm a lawyer. I'm a sports lawyer. Why am I delving around in the archives, in the cold, very cold archives, in the, in the Rudyard Kipling room? They have the Rudyard Kipling archive there. Um, so I sort of started to try and coalesce my thoughts for this. And this has been the saving grace, this thing. I found a portable scanner. This is just portable, just about portable. And what is unbelievable about it is it reads the page, pages that are on both sides and it collates them and you then turn them into searchable PDFs. I doubt I would have survived in there going through and taking notes. Now, there's been a quid pro quo. They've let me copy all of the material because I give it back to them as a digital. So I'm digi digitising their archive for them effectively and at the same time being able to work with, with PDFs. So I, d I don't think I could have survived just on, d on doing notes. So this thing has been an absolute godsend. I think it was about 350 quid. Um, absolutely worth it. So this is what I was trying to do, I think. I, I wanted to understand really how football was viewed, organised and played. And I should say at this point, I didn't really realise that there was this huge debate going on amongst football historians about the public schools versus Sheffield and I didn't enter into it for that debate although I think some of the things that are coming out are, are pertinent to it so I was sort of interested about how, how what went on how was it taught was it taught what sort of kit did they have did they have equipment what were the rules who did they play and then what I was really trying to do was to link to the stuff I normally do which was about how did they treat injuries and what was the culture of the game? How did they view the game? And I'm really interested in seeing whether what we now see in the game of, of rugby goes back to the culture that started in this period of time in the latter part of the, or mid latter part of the 19th century. And I've started to see a clear link to what was going on then to what's going on around the debates now. So I'm trying to draw out those things. I think it's quite difficult to do, but that's my end. That's my, and at the same time, I'm picking up the sort of micro bits. Uh, and this is my source. This is the first one, the school magazine that, that started in 1868, um, the Haley Burian. Uh, it was 
sixpence sold to the pupils. The most interesting thing, one of, one of the most interesting things about it, it's anonymous. And people posted contributions into a box that the editorial group, don't even know who they are because the editors aren't listed, would look at and correspondence would be through the magazine itself. So if you submitted something, you'd find out from the next issue um, whether or not it had been accepted. So we, we have a little section called Answer to Correspondence. Uh, KNB, not up to the mark. Or A, we refer you to the letter by H in our present number. So th this very strange method of producing copy went on. So I've got that, but there's not that much written about Haylebury School. There's a couple of books by Milford, um, and then there is some stuff about the old college that links about the building and the grounds, but there's not that much written in the same way there is about the other, about the other schools. Uh, but this is where, where, sort of where I'm up to so far. Uh, and I've done about the first um, hundred issues of this magazine. It came out about eight times a year and is somewhere normally around about 12 to 20 pages, depending on the what's on it. Uh, this is a recollection from a, a pupil. This is, I remember in 1863, Mr. Butler, who was the first master of the school, Reverend, standing on the steps of the pavilion with a call over list in his hand. And then setting who were to play on big side. They had 60, 60 on the side. So he would call and he would get the 60, who was in the 60. And another, another teacher, uh, master remembers, I remember being sent occasionally by Mr. Reed to arrange football games among the lower school and coach them. I think the scheme was drawn up by Mr. Butler. What we actually see is the, the head, the master of the school is responsible for developing this game. And the other teachers don't really have much of a role to play in it. And then we've got the houses that become quite important. And no kit. No one ever thought of changing for games, except on very grand occasions. None of us had football jerseys. And I remember when playing for the sixth against the modern school, getting a try, which I converted into a goal, because Isaacson was too much of a gentleman to hold on to my clothes. They're actually going and playing on this incredibly muddy field in their normal clothes and haven't thought about changing into or having any other kit. Uh, and here is a picture of the 1871 side who by now have got some kit. This is the 20. So the school at this point in time is picking a 20. And a group will have left the school and then whoever remains stays in the 20 and then you promote into the 20. So you can see now they've started to get some, uh, some uniforms of a sort. Um, here's them playing on, I think this is called 20 acre. So very, they have got a few pictures but they're, they're not particularly good quality. But it's a, just a massive Uh, and the school at this point is divided into six houses. Colville, Battle Frere, Edmonston, Lawrence, Thomason and Trevelyan. These are named after the great and the good from the school. These become really important for the rugby, for the football. So I thought I'd look at the cricket fixtures as well as to see what the cricket was doing. Cricket, they were playing Wellington School. Uppingham School. Rossell, which was part of this link to the school originally, and interestingly, Cheltenham as well. Both these games, one at the Oval and one at Lords. So they would actually go and play at these very grand grounds. But so we start to see cricket having fixtures, a few fixtures against other schools. So cricket is being played against a few other schools, not many, but, but football is not. So well, I've identified three types of, 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 of fixtures. The house matches, the houses become very, very important. Uh, and they're pitted against one another. And they take this from Eton, the idea of, of, of the cock cup, the cock house, the most important house, the house, the cock of the walk. So a lot of it's house matches. The, these house matches last for three days. They play for three consecutive days often ending nil-nil without any result. 
Then we have what they call foreign fixtures. These are against outsiders, outside teams. And then we have internal matches. So this is what I've found so far in terms of our foreign fixtures, our, our outsiders. Uh, lots of teams from Cambridge. Lots of Haley Burians went up to Cambridge to university and would play football there and then would come back and they would either invite Haleybury to go and play them or they would come back and bring a team. So various Cambridge teams. Jesus College, they had a link to and would play. Guy's Hospital was a, a, a regular fixture. King's College was an irregular fixture. Marlborough Nomads, which was a wandering side, they used to play twice a season. Then they start to play a past the present game in 1868, which becomes one of the most important games for them. Uh, Ravens Court Park. They then start playing Richmond, who are viewed, I think, at this, this point in time, as probably one of the premier football clubs um, around. So they have a fixture against one of the best clubs. There's a, there's a fixture listed for Blackie School, but I can't find any report of them actually playing it, so whether it actually was played or not. And then they travelled a little bit and played West Kent, and then they start to play uh, St Paul's, there is, a, there is a record of. They then play Cambridge Rugby Union. So there's a lot going on at Cambridge, and Cambridge seems to become the focal point for their fixtures. So these are their foreign fixtures, but few schools. Uh, what they love doing is they love these internal games. So the prefects will play the rest of the school. The sixth will play the school. The 20, the best 20, will play the whole of the rest of the school, however many want to play. And then the clergy would play the laity. If your initials were A to G, you'd play against H to Z. The quad against the non-quad. They were very keen on dividing themselves up physically, so this bit would play this bit. The patriarchs against the rest. The two best houses against the rest of the school. Uh, those with an R in their names would then play against, uh, against the rest. At one point, the chapel was constructed in a way that the, the, it, they were opposite each other. So the east and the west of the chapel would have a game against each other. Uh, upper sixth, upper fifth, classical. There's, there's blonde against brown hair. There's a whole different set of things going on. Uh, occasionally we get to some issue around... Uh, this is an a anonymous letter that goes into the journal. Why don't we play Wellington School? We play them at cricket, why don't we challenge them at football? Uh, this is where I've sort of got up to, I've cheated a bit because I've gone ahead of myself here and I'm interested here in, in the injury side of things. And you may not be able to see this, but this is a plaque in the chapel which reads, to the glory of God in the memory of Arthur Guy Adeen, two years, a member of Lawrence House where he was greatly loved. He died at the school from an accident of football. He died from football. And it's, it's, it's reported in the Times and the Evening Standard at the time that he, that he dies. So this is where I'm going to start to think about, about injuries. There's no, nothing in the way of reporting of injuries during this period that I'm looking at, apart from sprains and things. So injuries are starting to become an issue there. Uh, and this is the sort of link that I've got so far to the current day. It's all about com being compulsory. So this whole issue about football being compulsory, and should it be compulsory, which is exactly the debate that is ranging today about whether children who don't like physical contact in schools should be playing rugby. And here there's a debate going on about whether or not uh, this should be a compulsory thing. So my conclusion of, of today is that the football rules are largely drawn from rugby school and they try and bring them in line. So this, this is a clear alliance to rugby school. All self-governing by, by the students. Very little influence from anyone else. They have a committee of games who sorts out fixtures and runs the house competitions. No influence at all by uh, masters or coaches. It's chaotic. You, you, you read reports of, of the teachers, the masters, playing in this game, stripping off and going in and getting in amongst them and playing. Very inward looking. They're not going out to look at other schools. Uh, and the whole ethos of the school is looking towards different houses and looking amongst themselves. Injuries disregarded. And the last thing is, is compulsory. Uh, so this is very much work in progress and I would really welcome any thoughts about how best to develop this you know, from, from historical perspectives. Thank you. Questions from the floor? Have you found any indication
education uh, in terms of uh, how they thought about the value of the sports that they played. You know, things like um, whether it's character building and uh, about amateurs and, and that sort of thing. The, the, the interesting thing that's come out is that they, they feel, I think they're a, young, they're a young school and they're a bit in awe of some of the other schools and they think football is important if only because that's what a public school does. So it's almost like a, a secondary view of, 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 of football. We do football because that's what public schools do. Uh, and it also keeps them out of mischief. They say there's a lack of things to do in that term apart from football, largely because of weather and facilities. So they've got established rackets, fives, cricket. Football is the whole school. None of the rest of the sports are compulsory. Uh, so there is, a, there is a bit about character occasionally. And once they start going through pen pictures, they talk about character uh, in, in them. But it's not that, that sort of muscular Christianity approach doesn't seem to come out particularly, is what I've read. But then this is, this is being written by students. So whether they would appreciate that or not, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't think they're fictionalist, but it shows that unusual, really, because, I mean, it's, it's to me, what it suggests is what a small world football was, really, in the 1870s. You're looking at, it's, it's very much a minority occupation, in a sense. And um, I think, you know, if you look at other public schools, yeah, you know, you, you start to see inter-school fixtures appearing depending on, you know, quite often I think on geography, you know, whether they're yeah. close or not. But, uh, but even so, you know, these games where old boys are involved, and probably a lot of those fixtures are built on personal connections in the end, one way or another. Um, I don't think it's that, that was that unusual. I was going to ask you, because the RFU is, what, 1871, isn't it? I think, yeah. yeah. Were they involved in that in any way? Do you get any sense of it? They're, they're very thing? big in the Calcutta Cup. Right. And there's quite a few Haleburians are involved in the Calcutta Rugby Club. Uh, and that's a big thing because they yeah. go on there. Quite a few internationals. Um, but I, th I think the odd thing I found the fix, I thought if they're playing Wellington School at cricket, why aren't they playing them at football? Yeah. Uh, and if, if, they're starting to, if they're playing up again, why aren't they playing them at football? Mm -hmm. um, and there is a thing about locality because they do play cricket in Shrewsbury and so it's too far to go. You know, so we're not that one in the head. Yeah. Um, but I suppose it, it's it's then you've got the old boys playing against the schools, which seems odd. Mm. And you sort of why aren't the schools just playing against each other? Yeah. I guess it might. It's just easier to. <laughs> I think the old boys will bring the teams down. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Which would which make travelling easier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm just thinking on that point. I'm just wondering if they couldn't agree the rules. They do bring their, line, their rules in line with rugby, quite deliberately, because they say, we've checked these and these are in line. And there are only 17 rules at this point in time that they have. Uh, and occasionally, they're clearly upset with um, games ending without a score. Because at one point, uh, you get nothing unless you convert the try. So you get, you get nothing at all. So they then say, well, OK, tries will count if there's no goals. Uh, and, and then they start amending the rules slightly. But they did try and bring them in line. And I think the, the, they're certainly in line with Cambridge rules. Because that's why their link is to Cambridge. So I, I, what I need to do is to track rugby to Cambridge and, and how those rules are in line. Cricket is odd, though. They, there's games of cricket where they play the 11 against the 22. So you've got 11 on one side and 22 on the other. So the 11, when they're batting, I assume that they were all fielding, they've got to bowl out 22 players twice. That was just an extraordinary way of, yeah. of playing. I just wonder on the, uh, on the, on the different sports, were, were the masters involved in other sports in terms of organising fixtures outside of the school where you said that it's more chaotic and student driven in the rugby is there evidence that say you know, the masters are organizing fixtures with Wellington and, and other places is that it seems to be this committee of games which commit which was the head of the houses uh, which were the student head of the houses uh, and that the, the master sat on it but often didn't go but they've got no records of that committee which is a, which is unfortunate those haven't survived 
but this was the thing that ran the, all of the, the, the games inside the school, decided who had access to the fives courts or the, would there be a rackets uh, trophy. Um, so there doesn't seem to be the, there's no coaches, there's no real role for the masters apart from as, as, as involved in the houses. Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it seems like it's just drip upwards. So the, so the, the students themselves would, would, you yeah. would have organised like, the cricket yeah. matches and, and organised going to Lords and... Well, I've got no record of how they got there and, and who organised them. There's nothing in the bursar's accounts of, of, of being, being asked for money for it, so... Thanks, Doug. I, I enjoyed that. I particularly like the system of open peer review in the school magazine, which is sort of a feedback, I would guess. Uh, I've got a slightly different question. I'm interested in your role at the researcher as digitizer. Can you tell us a little bit more about that negotiation and whether what they're going to do with those digitized copies and what you're going to do with them? Well, hey, it, it's an odd place. Uh, 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 and. I don't think they have people who want to go and look at much stuff. Most of their stuff is around Kipling and war records. They're very big because they merged with the United Services College, which became the Imperial Services College. So they've got a lot of people with war records. A lot of people who've got the um, Victoria Cross, things like that. So most of their research that goes on there is looking around either Rudyard Kipling or, or war. Um, and I don't think anyone's done anything around... No, sport or, or anything else. So I just said, to Kenya, is it okay if I take pictures of them? And he said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, listen, the quid pro quo, I thought if you're good enough to let me take the pictures, I'll give you the copy. So I'm just effectively giving them the pictures that I've taken, I, so I collate them into a PDF and it just makes it, the person who comes next doesn't have to wade through the, through the books and has just got access to searchable PDFs. But are you free to distribute what you... Um, well, copyright's long since gone in them, uh, so yeah, I don't see why. I, it's not been broached, to be honest. <laughs> like, so, might well be libraries or universities that be happy to um, put that in the catalogue. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to be able to sell that to anyone. I think that their archive is, is it, it relies entirely on sort of one person doing stuff mm. and, and developing it and keeping stuff and. And so I think that the idea that someone can, can give him some digital stuff is probably quite attractive to them. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not particularly interested in doing stuff with the material other than the bits I want to use inside it, you know. So, it's fine. I, I've never really thought of it, to be honest. Um, it's, not, it's not arisen. Uh, might do later, I suppose. Time for a quick one. Yeah. yeah uh, I was just wondering if you could maybe comment on if ex students at school. Certainly involved with the Calcutta Cup. Uh, they have a lot of internationals. Um, I mean, they're still producing internationals. Jamie George is a is a, a Liburian. Um, uh, so quite a long history of of players going to Cambridge, Oxford, and Cambridge, and being involved in rugby there, being involved in wandering sides. There's a lot of wandering sides at this point in time. Uh, and the Old Boys Association. I've not seen anything in terms of the administration other than the Calcutta Rugby Club. Um, I, I've not traced anyone who's gone on to, into, into administration. I've been more looking at the sort of playing side, playing side of things, to be honest. But I'm sure, given that there'll be some somewhere. Thanks very much, Steve.